Good morning. Would you pray with me? So, Father, we we ask that you would help us to turn our heart to attune our hearts to your heart, both in the preaching and in the receiving. But most importantly, Lord, what you are speaking to us in and through your Word, by your living presence, by your living Word speaking to us at all times. But in this moment, Lord, help us to be attentive. Amen. So we all dream of going to places where the presence of God is pouring out and overflowing. Have you ever been through going through a really rough time, a time of suffering, and you really needed to have a real encounter with God? You came, you prepared, you showed up, and your hopes were crushed. Too much marketing hype, too much show, too much performance, too much money, and far too little God. Passover in the Holy Land. Surely there I will receive a visitation from God. At the time of Jesus, Jerusalem was a hot mess, politically and spiritually. I know that may be hard to relate to, but please try. (laughs) After the first few centuries following the golden age of Israel, when King David ruled in Jerusalem in 1000 BC, the city has been ruled by different empires about every 100 to 200 years. Babylon, Persia, the Greeks. After the Maccabean rebellion pushed out the Greeks in 167 BC, Jerusalem had independence for about 100 years under the Hasmonean kings. But the kingdom was weakened through infighting, civil war, factions, bickering, some of which sided with Rome. Israel became a vassal king of Rome in 63 BC, really not all that long before the birth of Jesus. Rome initially ruled through the Hasmonean kings. Rome trusted wealthy families and liked appointing them as local collaborators to rule on Rome's behalf. Local rulers were given fairly free hand provided they were loyal to Rome, maintained order, as well as collect and paid the annual tribute to Rome. Herod was born in 72 BC and rose to power through his father's good relations with the newly appointed, self-appointed dictator of Rome, Julius Caesar. Herod built his connections with the Roman leader, Mark Anthony, and served Rome successfully, supporting the Hasmonean king, collecting taxes, and ridding his area of bandits. In 40 BC, the nephew of the Hasmonean king colluded with the Parthians, the enemies of Rome, to take the throne from his uncle. Herod went to Rome to plead to restore the king to power, but the Roman Senate unexpectedly unexpectedly named Herod as king of the Jews. Really, Herod? That's the story you have? I think you have some explaining to do. Herod and and the Roman governor of Syria at the direction of Mark Anthony, set out with a large army to take Jerusalem in 37 BC, sending that upstart nephew to Mark Anthony for execution. Thus the Hasmonean dynasty ended and the Herodian dynasty began. Rome was interested in loyalty and results and Herod was the man for the job. Herod was the king of the Jews they were looking for. Herod was a ruthless leader, navigating political upheavals in Rome and reigning as king until his death in 4 BC. He disposed the old elites and replaced them with new ones who owed their position to him. He kept a firm grip on his subjects, prohibiting unauthorized gatherings and severely limited the power of the high priest. Herod expected the religious leaders to legitimize his rule with the approval of God. Although Jewish law said the high priest was to serve for life, Herod appointed and disposed seven high priests during his 33-year reign as king. Herod killed more than a few members of his own family, who he felt threatened his reign. In the last year of his life, he tried to kill the infant Jesus. Herod was the second greatest builder in the Roman Empire. The infrastructure of Jerusalem became magnificent under his reign with aqueducts and theaters. Above all, he rebuilt the temple. Beginning in 20 BC, Herod remodeled the modest 
post-exilic temple, but in effect built a new temple surrounded by spacious courts and elegant colonnades with a sumptuous use of marble and gold. To do so, he first had to construct an enormous platform about 1,550 feet by 1,000 feet, almost 40 acres. Even the non-Jewish writers described the temple complex as the most magnificent in the Roman Empire. To please the Jews, Herod employed priests trained as masons so that the temple would be erected according to the law. Herod also built an enormous 700,000 square foot palace for himself, which after his death became the residence of the Roman governors, including Pilate when they were in Jerusalem. It was a luxurious marble palace with with columns of colored marble and glittering fountains, shaded pools, ceilings painted with gold and vermilion, chairs of silver and gold inlaid with jewels, mosaic floors with agate and lapis lazuli. Josephus mourned the loss of of Herod's palace in 70 AD. He said it tormented his soul. It was so beautiful. All of this cost an enormous amount of money, which is gained through the confiscation of family farms through debt to create rich estates for the elites, high taxation, and even extortion from the wealthy families who owed their wealth to Herod. When Herod died in 4 4 BC, his rulership over Israel was divided up and passed to his three sons at the approval of Rome. Archelaus took over the largest part of the Judean kingdom, Judea, Idumea, south of Judea, and Samaria, north of Judea. In 6 AD, Archelaus was removed from power and banished by Rome for his unpopularity with the Jews, his brutality, and mostly his incompetence. Joseph and Mary avoided Judea until after Herod Archelaus had been removed from power. After removing Archelaus from power, Rome turned the rulership of Judea over to the Roman prefect, changing them every few years. At the time of the Passover, that was Pilate. But we'll hear from Pilate next week. He can tell his own story. The other two portions of Herod's kingdom were given to his other two sons, Antipas inherited Galilee and Perea. All those who came after the original Herod took the name of Herod as title. There are at least eight rulers who took the name Herod in the Bible. As if the constantly changing rulers was not confusing enough, let's just all change our name to be the same one. But Herod of Antipas in Galilee is the one in the Easter story. Why is this important? People hated and feared the Herods. They were the worst and most visible symbol of collaboration with Rome. And on top of that, they were only half Jewish. The people hated them. But they were impressed with all that Herod had built, especially the temple. Even Jesus' disciple were in shock and awe at the beauty and grandeur of the temple. The elites in Jerusalem, the high priests, scribes, and Pharisees with wealthy families had been groomed and pruned to collaborate with Rome for the past 90 years. They knew how the world works and the importance of backing the right patrons and politicking, brown-nosing, and and the fighting it took to keep them in power. Rome ran on the love and glory of man. The elites wanted no part of any Messiah who would incur the wrath of Rome or upset your local house of cards that would cost them their wealth and position. They knew who buttered their bread. If you love the glory that comes from the world, you will become blind to the glory that comes from God. And what did the people expect from their Messiah? The power of God to usher in the kingdom of God. And what would the kingdom of God look like? Well, it would look a lot like David's kingdom, only bigger and better. Rome redefined empire, and Herod had built a temple that was the most magnificent in the Roman Empire. Surely the Messiah would take up residence in the palace, of, in the palace, and God's protection and glory would fill the temple after Israel purged herself of the collaborators. 
It doesn't matter that corruption and taxation and extortion that was used to pay it to construct the temple, the palace, and even Jerusalem. An inconvenient truth, soon forgotten, whether by sword of man or fire from heaven, the Messiah would take by force, take it by force and use it for the glory of God and Israel. Those on top would be cast down and those on the bottom would be elevated to positions of prestige, power, and wealth. If you love the glory that comes from this world, you will become blind to the glory that comes from God. And God's glory is quite opposite from what we expect. In the Gospel of Mark, chapters 8 through 9, Jesus plainly tells his disciples on three different occasions that the Son of Man must suffer many things. He is going to be delivered into the hands of men, rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. The first time they hear this, Peter takes Jesus aside to rebuke him. But it's not the first time Jesus has heard this. Jesus recognizes its source. Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. If you love the glory that comes from this world, you will become blind to the glory that comes from God. And the second time Jesus tells them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. And they still did not understand, and they were afraid to ask him. Instead, they began to argue about who would be the greatest among them. If you, Lori, if you love the glory that comes from this world, you'll become blind to the glory that comes from God. After the third time, while they were on the road heading up to Jerusalem, Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed and afraid. See, we are going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John and the sons of Zebedee came to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, yes, we're able. And Jesus said to him, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand or my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the 10 heard it, they became indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, Now you know those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to serve, to be served, but to serve and give his life as ransom for many. Even after three years and three plain statements by Jesus about going to Jerusalem to suffer and die, all they can think of is the glorious reign that will follow and their place in it. Their entire view of the structure of the kingdom of God looks like David, Rome, and Herod, the kingdoms of this world, only with a better king. This is not so different than how many today view the kingdom of God with Christ returning with armies to wage war and establish the kingdom by conquest and might of arms. This is how the world establishes governments. How do we expect God to establish his kingdom? 
conquering by force? Is that how he will glorify his name in 33 AD? How about in the Crusades of the Middle Ages? How about in 2023? How about when Jesus returns? Church, we have some explaining to do. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as ransom for many. But Jesus, that is just not how the world works. Freedom must be bought with blood. If we don't fight, the tyrants of this world will take our jobs, our homes, our way of life and liberty. They will occupy our nation and may very well kill us. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? After Peter rebuked Jesus for taking the path of suffering and death, and Jesus turns to him and says, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples and the crowd, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? I know this is hard to hear and hard to accept. The Lord knows it is hard to hear and hard to accept. But the Lord knows what you were born to become. The Lord knows what your soul most desires. The Lord knows that your blessedness, your truest, happiest joy, can only be found in Him. If we keep following the way of the world, exchanging the winners and losers, we only perpetuate the tyranny of man in the name of God. But hey, now we're on top. Jesus comes to give His life as a ransom for many, and save the world from our captivity to this system of self-serving evil. If you love the glory that comes from this world, you will become blind to the glory that comes from God. During Passover, Jerusalem swelled from 400,000 to over 200,000 inhabitants. Pilate, the ruling governor, who normally resided in Caesarea, the seaport that Herod built, would come with a large cohort of soldiers for his protection and reinforce the local garrison in keeping order in Jerusalem. He rode in from the west, high atop his horse, leading his cohorts armed to the teeth and taking up residence in the palace that Herod built. The The way of Rome was peace through exercise of deadly force, through shock and awe. Jesus would arrive in Jerusalem, coming down from the east, where he was staying with friends in Bethany. Jesus would be anointed for his burial. The way way of Jesus was peace through self-sacrificial glory of God, through the self-sacrificial glory of God. While Pilate rode on his high horse through the western gate by the governor's palace, Jesus, Jesus would approach from the gate to the east, passing through Bethany and the Mount of Olives, humbly on a donkey in fulfillment of Scripture. This is what Jesus' followers and those who heard about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead came to see. Waving palm branches and spreading their cloaks in homage, the long-awaited day had finally come. This is Moses about to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. This is Joshua taking the promised land. This is the son of David restoring Israel to her golden years. If you love the glory that comes from this world, you will become blind to the glory that comes from God. Jesus knew in advance all that would transpire this week. That he would be betrayed, 
falsely accused by a corrupt system, and crucified. Knowing all this, knowing how, sick, <laughs> how fickle and superficial we are, he allows us this moment to celebrate the coming of the Messiah, even though we are still clueless to what he is really doing. It's not just the excitement of the crowd. Creation itself, the very rocks, are welcoming, welcoming the true Messiah, the Redeemer and Savior, not only of Jerusalem, but of the entire world. And not only the entire world, but all creation. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But as Jesus passes the temple towering over them, I can't but help to think that he is reminded of the temptation of Satan for esteem and affection, the adoration of the people, the temptation for power and control to rule over all the earth and establish a truly righteous and benevolent empire. If he will but bow down and worship the ruler of this age. Jesus is not tempted. That test has already been won. But he understands the temptations of the scribes and the Pharisees, of governors and kings in Israel, of emperors and senators in Rome, of you and me. Our temptation to fulfill each sphere and relationship in life through the power of the flesh, our false self who has wandered far from God and is hopelessly lost. He knows and comes to set us all free from the darkness that has blinded our eyes, imprisoned our hearts, and allow tyranny to reign captive in our souls. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. The Father looks fully upon the sin of Jerusalem and foresees their ways of domination, conflict, and warfare will result in horrific suffering. In Jesus, we see the face of the Father It is not contorted in anger and the need to punish those corrupt leaders of church and of state and make them suffer. He weeps. He desires them to follow him in the ways of making peace. And he knows they cannot hear it. He knows the ways of Rome will be ruthless. Even this temple, the pride of Jerusalem, will be totally toppled. Every stone will be cast down into the valley below, leaving nothing but the bare 40-acre platform upon which it now stands. Nothing but the retaining wall of the platform will remain, a reminder through the centuries of what was lost and taken and is no more. The stones were quarried, shaped, built, and gilded with marble and gold, with monies raised through taxation and extorted from the people by Herod, the great despot. They too will be redeemed by the true king, the true high priest, the true lamb of God who will turn this temple into the house of God with us. The rocks and trees use the voices of the people to cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Have you ever been out hiking? and heard nature joining their voice to yours and worshiping our great and beautiful creator. With Hosanna filling his ears and tears filling his eyes, Jesus enters the temple and dries out those selling and profiting off the people who came to draw near to God, but grew jaded at the scalp prices for exchanging Roman coin for the proper temple coin and the highly inflated prices for temple-approved sacrificial animals. He ever came to church to encounter God, but all you got was hype and show. Jesus taught daily in the temple, and the people were hanging on to his words. 
They found the one that their hearts were truly looking for. Now among the Greeks who went up to worship at the feast were some Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Well, the chief priests, scribes, and principal men of the city knew that Jesus was undermining their prestige and their prophets with every word he said. They wanted to arrest him, but could not because the people were drawn to him. As Jesus continued to teach and denounce the hypocritical ways of the priest and warn them that their whole corrupt system would come crashing down on them, they sought to kill him. This, too, is the heart of the Father, seeking to bring his rebellious priests who continually dishonor him to change direction and follow his ways. He speaks softly to the wounded and harshly to the hardened, not to condemn and punish, but to save them from their headlong plunge into darkness. Turn to me, O man, and be saved. Jesus' soul was troubled, but he was not seeking escape. He was seeking to go through it. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Some of the authorities even believed him, but they could not confess it for fear that the Pharisees would put them out of the synagogue. They had come seeking their love, their love of the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Again and again, Jesus admonishes them to walk in the light while they have the light to believe in the light, and to become sons of light. But they did not recognize the time of their visitation. If you love the glory that comes from this world, you you will become blind to the glory that comes from God. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees him, sees him who sent me, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who sent me has given himself has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. This is the last recorded public teaching in John chapter 12. 
Jesus has many more wonderful things to say to his disciples in private after they return to Bethany each evening. I encourage you to read John chapters 13 through 17, Monday through Thursday of this week. On Friday, read the betrayal and trial of Jesus, his crucifixion and burial. But wait until Sunday morning to read about the resurrection in chapter 20, and then come and worship with us. I am convinced that the reason we miss our time of visitation is because we have been taught that the kingdom of God is far too much like the kingdom of this world. We expect God to conquer and rule through the fear-based methods of men. We have been taught that if God looks at us, he will be filled with judgment and loathing. We are taught to respond in fear and shame and guilt. We are taught that God manipulates us, just like people manipulate us and we manipulate others. Well, have you ever heard this? That the Father cannot forgive sin but needs to exact payment through punishment? That on the cross, Jesus was saving us from God needing to punish our sin? Have you ever heard that Jesus came as a gentle lamb but will return as a wrathful lion? If you love the glory that comes from this world, you will become blind to the glory that comes from God. Jerusalem was supposed to be a holy city that taught the nations, but had become as corrupt as all the great cities that had come before it and after. Again and again, the Father sends her prophets and teachers, which again and again she kills. Each time her captivity to sin catches up with her, God weeps, longing for her to return, to be restored, to be healed. God's commandment is eternal life. In Revelation 21, 1 through 5, we read, Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. When God looks at you, he weeps. God weeps for the unnecessary suffering this unjust world has inflicted on you. God weeps for the unnecessary suffering you inflict on yourself and on others. God weeps for you to turn to him and take shelter. God weeps for you to turn to the light, to walk in the light, and to become children of light. God weeps for your captivity to fear and the blindness to his love. God weeps with you in the pain of necessary suffering needed to die to self that you might rise to your true self in him. God weeps for you in the shared pain of taking up your cross and following him. And God weeps for the joy of the fulfillment of his desire and command for you, eternal life. And God weeps for joy, saying us all as one in the new Jerusalem, the beautiful, perfect bride of Christ. Then there will be no more weeping. All will be new creation. And God will be all in all. For these reasons, for the love of the Father burning in him, Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem to ransom us from our captivity to sin and death. The Lamb of God pours out his life and his death would become one with our death, that our life would become one with his life. His life is eternal, so our life in him is eternal, and death will be no more. 
Jesus, the Passover lamb. Our protection from death, food for the journey, gives himself to be our food, pours out his blood to make a new covenant and ask us to take up our cross and follow him. If you love the glory that comes from God, you will behold the Son, and in the Son you will behold the Father, the Father in me, I in you, you in me. This is life in the Spirit. This is eternal life. I ask you to close your eyes and quiet your heart. Lord, what are you speaking right now in this moment of visitation? Take a deep breath. Let go of striving. Let go of needing to hear something. And just be attentive to whatever the Lord may speak or however the Lord may just sit with you in silence. What thoughts or feelings arise? Maybe it's praise, maybe it's adoration, maybe it's a hot mess of darkness and captivity, maybe it's love for the world. Whatever it is, invite it to the table. Don't cast it out, don't judge it, condemn it. It's a part of you. Invite it to the table to come, to know the Lord, to be healed, to be allowed to grow. Come and be seen by the Lord. Feel his love. Feel his tears. Feel his compassion. His body broken. His blood poured out. His death in your death. His life in your life. The night that Jesus was betrayed, He took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take this, eat of it, all of you. This is my body broken for you. This is God's meal with us. And he took the cup and he gave thanks. This is my blood poured out for you, the blood of the new covenant. It will be shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. So as we come, remember him. Not only he who came and died on our behalf, who surrendered up his life to join our life to his, but remember to turn off and to seek his face. For he's not coming with shame and guilt. He's coming filled with love and compassion. The brown, cups are, um, the brown cups are wine, the blue cups are juice. So bring all that you are, not just your pious and best selves, but the very worst parts of you. The Lord will help you filter them out. He will separate the, the sheep from the goat within you. He will take your heart and purify it. He will take those things that are captive to this world and set them free. He will give you the strength to die to them so that he can rise in you, his life, new creation, the fulfillment of his love. Come. Yeshua, God is salvation, Emmanuel, God with us. This is your name, Lord Jesus. This is who you are. 
Lord, you did not come to shine light on us, to shame us and manipulate us through fear and guilt of punishment. But you come with the love of the Father. Your word is a living sword that cuts us free down the middle, separating that which loves you from that which does not, so that we would be free, not only in the life to come, but in this life, For, Lord, this is where you are. You are with us, not far off, but with us, breathing within us, your spirit binding us to you, to your worship, to your love, the Father in you, Jesus, and you in us, and us in you. As you give time each day to attune your heart to the presence of God within you, when the voice of shame and fear and guilt and ought to rises up, turn your eyes to the Father, for He is looking at you with compassion and love and communion and union. And do not compare what the Lord has called you to, to that of others, and do not let others define it for you. For the Lord is with you, speaking to your heart. So don't assume that the hardest road is the one he's calling you to. And don't assume that the highest position is the one he's calling you out of in all things, in everything. Seek his presence. How is he leading you in this moment? For we live in the now with him, not in the past and not in the future, but now, God with us. Believe the gospel, receive it, and walk in it so that you might know the fullness of his joy beating in your chest, filling your lungs, filling your life with light and love and blessedness. Amen.